Today we're going to talk about inverses. And so we're going to find the inverse of a function, but in order to start that, we really want to um, discuss a couple things about inverses. So we're going to start here, and we've got the half, half of a rocket drawn on this graph right here. And I've gone ahead and put the points for this. If we went ahead and switch these, so my y values became my x values, I would go straight down the line and just switch them. That's all we're going to do with this one. So I have now changed these values. The ones that were X and Y, I flipped them on this one. My Y's became the new X's and my X's became the new Y's. That is going to graph the other side of this rocket. So we're going to go ahead and do that. So here we see the other side of the rocket was drawn by flipping these values from flipping the X's to become my new Y's and the Y's to become my new X's. That is because when you do that, you get a reflection across this Y equals X line. And that's what's drawn there in the beginning. So this is Y equals X. And when you flip the X and Y values, you get a reflection across that line. That is called an inverse. So the relationship between that, the points in table one and table two or the graph is called an inverse. That's when your X and Y are switched and it is um, your inputs become your output. So here's our definition of an inverse. To find the inverse, we simply switch the X and Y values. The inverse is a reflection of the graph over the Y equals X line. Most of the time we write that it, with this notation here, F with this little negative one on the top of X, that stands for inverse. So when you see that up there, you are looking for its inverse. And again, its definition is when we switch the X and Y values, and it is a reflection over that Y equals X line. So that's what an inverse is. All right, we're gonna continue looking at this second graph here. And so we've got a graph um, we talk about its domain and range. So it starts here at negative nine. So this black graph is the one we're gonna start with. It starts at negative nine for the domain. And then we have all of these X values until we get to eight. That's where our last point is on this graph here for X. For Y, it starts at negative two. That's the smallest Y value. And then it starts to climb up and the biggest Y value is nine. So we get this domain and this range here. With an inverse, since we switched inputs and outputs, that is also going to switch. So your range becomes your domain and your domain becomes your range. Those switch because when we switch the input and output, remember that's your domain and your range. So we also switch the domain and the range. And again, it's a reflection across that Y equals X line. So if we graph that right there, we would see that's a reflection. That's what an inverse is. This is my main function. This is my inverse function. Now, if we've talked about functions now to determine if it's a real function, um, hopefully from algebra one, you remember the vertical line test. If you dropped a vertical line anywhere on this graph and it hits only in one point, then it is a function. So this black graph is a function. If I drop a vertical line anywhere, it only hits in one place. So yes, the original one is a function. Now, if I test its inverse function, which is the orange one, um, when I go right here, I am hitting in two places. It is hitting right there and right there. This does not pass the vertical line test. It should only hit in one place. And there's a couple places where it does that here and here, and there and there. So it is hitting more than one point when tested by that vertical line. So the inverse is not a function. Um, so in Algebra 1, you learned that vertical line test that we just did there, dropping a vertical line. But you can actually determine if the inverse will be a function with a horizontal. So if I looked at only this black graph, that's what we're going to do now, is just look at the original. I'm looking now at just this original. And if I wanted to know if its inverse was going to be a function, then I would drop a horizontal line. And so see here at a horizontal line, it hits in two places. We would hit here and here. 
So this fails the horizontal line test. The horizontal line test doesn't tell you anything about this function. It tells you about its inverse function. So if it passes the horizontal line test, its inverse will be a function. If it fails the horizontal line test, then its inverse will not be a function. So with this one, without even graphing its inverse, I know its inverse will not be a function because it fails the horizontal line test. So this graph is a function, but its inverse is not a function because it fails the horizontal line test. So let's talk about those line tests. I've got a couple little definitions here for you. The vertical line test checks to see if the graph is a function. To pass it, the vertical line test only hits one point. So again, that vertical line test tests itself. So this passes the vertical line test. So it is a function. The horizontal line test checks to see if the inverse graph will be a function. To pass the horizontal line test, it can only hit in one point. So this fails the horizontal line test, so its inverse will not be a function. Vertical line test, test itself. Horizontal line test, test its inverse. All right, so we saw some random graphs on the other side. Now we're going to look at um, some equations that we've dealt with already. This first one is a quadratic. So we've got f of x equals x minus 2 squared plus 4. And this is a function we've dealt with earlier in the year, so we should be able to do a lot of different things with this. Um, you should be able to determine the vertex. Remember, the vertex is this c value and this d value. So our vertex is at 2, 4. So I would go to 2, 4, and there is my vertex. Now this is also the parent function, only moved to the right 2 because of this part right here. Remember, transformations really helps us out with graphing. So it has gone to the right 2 and up 4. So right 2, up 4. There's no stretching or compressing. There's no um, reflections. So it is exactly like the parent function. So the next two points over are going to go to the right one and up one and to the left one and up one. The next one would go to the right two and up four and to the left two and up four. And there is my original graph right there, the quadratic. All right, so I'm going to fill out the table with some of those points that we just graphed. And so that would be 0, 8 as my first point, 1, 5, 2, 4, which was the vertex, 3, 5, and 4, 8. We can see the symmetry there for our points, and our vertex is right in the middle. All right, this is opening upward. We knew that because there was no reflection here. There's no minus. So it was going to open upward, so this is concave up. Our domain is all real numbers because it goes all the way to the left and all the way to the right. And our range starts right here at 4 and goes up forever. So this would be from 4 to infinity. And we are going to include that 4 because it is right there on our range. Now we're going to talk about finding its inverse. So to find its inverse, we would take these values and switch them. That's what you're doing with the inverse. You're switching that input and output. So our new x values are going to be the y values that were in the other graph. And our new y values are going to be the ones that were on the x. So I'm going to go ahead and graph those down. So we've got 8, 0. We've got 5, 1. We've got 4, 2. We've got 5, 3, and we've got 8, 4. There is our inverse graph. We can test this by drawing the y equals x line because an inverse is a reflection across that y equals x line. So I'm going to go ahead and graph that just so you can see that it is definitely an inverse. So 
So we see that they are a reflection across that line. If I folded it right here on the y equals x line, this quadratic would land right on top of this graph right here. So they are inverses of each other. I've graphed that by switching my x and my y values for this graph. So some of the things we're going to talk about this graph here, our vertex is now right here. So the new vertex is at 4, 2, which we knew because the first one was at 2, 4, and the inverse one is a switch of that x and y. It is now opening sideways instead of up and down, and its domain starts here at 4. This is the smallest x value and then goes to the right forever. So our domain is from 4 to infinity. As this is going this way, it's going up. And as it's going this way, it's going down. So we're going to hit every single y value. So that's going to be all real numbers. If we look at this now, compared to our original here, they switched. So that's a big thing you should notice. They switch. You are switching the input and the output values for inverses. So that has switched our domain and range. All right, the last thing with inverse is writing the equation. And so here we start with our x minus 2 squared plus 4. Just like we switched our x and y here to make these tables, we do the same thing with the equation. So we're going to switch that x and y to find the inverse. Now, y is still the dependent variable, and we never leave that inside of an equation. So you would not want to leave it like this. You would want to solve for this y. So we're going to subtract the 4 to get it to the other side. That gives us x minus 4 is equal to y minus 2 squared. To get rid of a squared function here, we need to get rid of that by taking the square root. Those are um, opposites of each other and will cancel each other out. Now, whatever I do to one side, I must do to the other. So I'm going to do that to both sides. And I am taking a square root of a square. So this could be a negative or a positive. So I would also need plus or minus there. Now the square root and the square cancel out and we get plus or minus the square root of x minus four is equal to y minus two. My last step would be to add two. Now there's a square root here. So when I add this two, I cannot make it go under the square root. So my final equation would be plus or minus the square root of x minus 4, and the plus 2 would be on the outside. This would be our inverse function. Now, this is a big one. So we did quadratics. We just found the inverse of a quadratic. It is a square root function. That's our new unit. We're in the square root function unit. Um, I do want to graph these on the calculator just so that I can show you something. Um, so we're going to go ahead and graph this, and I get x minus 2. Here's my original I'm going to do first. So there's my quadratic. Sorry, there's a little glare there. There we go. On my second one, I'm going to put this in, but I'm only going to put in the positive. So I hit second and then x squared to get that square root, x minus 4, and then outside I've got this plus 2. All right, if I hit graph, I'm going to get my quadratic. And then there is the square root. Now you got another glare, sorry about that. There we go. All right, so this only has one side of it. It's got this top side that we graphed here. That's because I didn't put that negative. So that's why you need that plus or minus. If you only put the plus, then you're only giving one side of that quadratic. If I went in here and I did the negative, that would give me the other side. So in order to have both sides here, we need that plus or minus. And that's because of um, when we graph, when we wrote the equation here and we took the square root of a square, anytime you take the square root of a square, you need that plus or minus. All right, on many occasions, we are going to restrict the domain. 
to only one side of the quadratic so that we can deal with only one side of our radical here. And that's because let's talk about those vertical and horizontal line tests. So a vertical line test, anywhere I drop it here on my quadratic, it passes. But if I do a horizontal line test, it fails. These two right here would touch a horizontal line test and it can only touch once. So I knew that my inverse was not going to be a function. So fails horizontal line test. So I know that this inverse graph is not gonna be a function. Now, if I test it with the vertical line, I see it's not a function anyway, because it hits two on the vertical line here. But I already knew that if I, if I would have done the horizontal line test. In order to make its inverse a function, we will restrict the domain quite a bit. So we would say um, x is greater than two here and only use this side, and then we wouldn't need the plus or minus there. And we'll get to that a little bit later. All right, we're going to try another one here, and we're going to start with a square root function. And this one I'll go ahead and put in the calculator since we haven't graphed those just yet. I know you can do them with the transformations, but just in case, we'll go ahead and do it on the calculator for this one. So we take the square root of x plus 3, whoops, square root of x plus 3, and then I use my arrow key to get out of that square root. That's an important part when you're keying these in because if you're not careful, you might leave it underneath. When you look at this, the square root should clearly end right there, and then the minus 2 should be on the outside, like it looks on your paper. All right, if I go to the graph of this, I see there's a bunch of errors, and that's because we know we can't take the square root of a negative. That gives you an imaginary number, so that doesn't work. Um, so the first value that we would have here is that negative 3, negative 2. Then negative 2, negative 1, 1, 0, 6, 1, and 13, 2. So I'm going to go ahead and graph those. Those will be my original ones. So negative 3, negative 2, negative 2, negative 1, 1, 0, 6, 1, and 13, 2 kind of goes off my paper there. So here is going to be my original graph. The vertex is at negative 3, negative 2. It is opening to the side, to the right. Our domain, this is the smallest x value we see, negative 3. We saw everything else had an error this way. So this is my first x value. So that's going to start at negative 3. And it's going to go forever to the right. So it's going to go from negative 3 to infinity. This is my first y value here at negative 2. There's nothing below this point in the y's. So negative 2 is my first y value, and it goes up forever. So we've got this. To find the inverse, we switch these. So this is going to be negative 2, negative 1, 0, 1, and 2. My new y values are going to be negative 3, negative 2, 1, 6, and 13. All right, so now we're going to graph those to see what our graph looks like. So I go to negative 2, negative 3. There's my first point. Negative 1, negative 2. There's my second point. 0, 1, third point. 1, 6. And then 2, 13 kind of goes off the graph as well, so I won't graph that one. But here is my new graph. Uh, we can tell it's the inverse because we see that it's a reflection across this y equals x line. If I graph that there, I can see that if I folded it over, they would fall right on top of each other. This would be the vertex of my quadratic. We said square roots and quadratics are inverses of each other. So we know that this is a quadratic. It's only one side of the quadratic. And we knew that was going to happen because there is not a plus or minus here. So we only need one side of the quadratic for it to reflect. So our vertex is going to be at negative 2, negative 3. And our direction would be up. That's going to be a quadratic that opens up. Remember symmetry? I could graph the other side there if I wanted to with the symmetry. Our domain is now negative 2 to infinity. 
and our range is negative 3 to infinity. That's right there. So these switched. Everything switches here. All right, now we're going to talk about our equation. We are going to go ahead and find the inverse of this. So we switch our x and our y. And now we're going to solve for this y because we don't want to leave the y on the inside part of the equation. So we add the 2 to get it to the other side. And that gives us x plus 2 equals the square root of y plus 3. To get rid of the square root, we're going to have to square both sides because that's the opposite one. The square root and the square cancel, and we get x plus 2 squared equals y plus 3. We have freed what was inside the square root by taking the square of both sides. And then my last step would be to subtract 3. And so here we've got x plus 2 squared minus 3. Now, when I get to this point, I cannot stop there because if I think about the graph of this, let's go ahead and graph it in our calculator, in fact, so you could see it. Here was our initial function. Sorry about that, trying to find a spot where you don't have a glare. There we go. On my second one, I'm going to go ahead and put in the equation we just found to be the inverse. That's x plus 2 squared and then minus 3. If I hit graph, I end up with this right here. Those two are clearly not the same thing because we've only got one side on this one and then here we've got two sides that does not work so I need to tell it only this right side of the quadratic is needed so we write 4 x is greater than or equal to negative 2 we want to stop it right there so that none of this side is part of our function because we cannot reflect something that's not there. So you have to restrict the domain to say x is greater than or equal to negative 2. And that would be the true inverse. All right, last time we talked about compositions. And so we want to expand on that now because you can determine if something is an inverse by doing compositions. If f of g of x is equal to x and g of f of x is equal to x, then f of x and g of x are inverses of each other. So if we were asked, are these two inverses of each other? There's several ways you can do that. You can graph them to see if they're a reflection across the x. You can look at their tables and see if the x and y values are switched. Or you can go ahead and take the inverse of each and see if it comes out to be the inverse. And then the last way is to determine it by finding f of g of x and g of f of x. So for f of g of x, remember that's when we're plugging the g of x equation into the f equation. So I would take this x cubed and I would plug it into the x in the other equation. So I get the cube root of x cubed. I just took the x cubed and I only substituted just that x. Everything else stays the same. Now we know that this cube root and this cube cancel out. So f of g of x is equal to x. Well, that's what we were looking for. So yes, that tells me it is. Now I need to check the other way to make sure that it is in fact an inverse. So I check both ways. In this case, we're plugging the f of x into the g equation. So I'm going to go the other way. I'm going to take this cube root of x and I'm going to plug it in for the x in the other equation. Remember, that's the only thing that changes. So it's still going to be cubed. This is x cubed, so this would be my new x cubed. And so we'll go ahead and plug in my new x, which is the cube root of x. These two cancel, and that is x. So yes, they are inverses. Now that was a really easy one, so we're gonna go ahead and try another one. So for the second one here, again, I wanna find f of g of x and g of f of x. So I'll start with this one. I wanna plug in my g of x equation 
into the other one. So I'm only going to substitute the x with that. So I get the square root, my new x minus 2. That's the f equation. And now I'm going to plug in x squared plus 2 in there. Plus 2 minus 2 is 0, so that cancels out. And so I'm left with the square root of x squared. One of the things we see students do often is cancel out the square root and the square. You cannot do that. You're breaking order of operations. The plus 2 and minus 2 goes away first because that's all under the radical. Now you can cancel that. You could not cancel that up here. And so what's left is x. That's a good sign. That tells me they're probably inverses. So I'm going to go ahead and do the other one to verify. Now I'm going to go the other way. So we have an x squared plus 2. That's my g function. That's the one I'm going to leave on the outside. And then my f function is what's going to go in as the x. So I get the square root of x minus 2. In this case, we've got the square root squared, so we can cancel that because that's the only thing that's there. That frees up my x minus 2 there. Now minus 2 plus 2 is 0, so that goes away and leaves just x. So they are inverses because they're equal to just x. We'll do one more. I'll start by finding f of g of x. So my f function is going to be on the outside, so I get 2x squared plus 5. That would be 2. That's going to be my new x squared plus 5. So I've not changed anything in this equation except for the x. That x is going to be this new part right here. And so we get negative 2x squared minus 5 in there. All right, in order to simplify this, we would have to do either the box or FOIL because remember, that is the same thing as that right there. That's what that square means, is that there are two of them. So we would FOIL this out and we would get 4x to the fourth plus 10x squared plus 10x squared plus 25. That's what's going to be my new parentheses there. So I get 4x to the 4th plus 20x squared plus 25. And then we've got that plus 5 at the end there. To get rid of this 2 now, I need to distribute. So we get 8x to the 4th plus 40x squared plus 50 plus 5. My last step to combine those like terms is going to be to add that 50 and the 5, so we get 55. That is clearly not equal to x, so these are not inverses. So you can prove whether they're inverses or not using compositions that we did last time. All right, just for good measure, we're going to do one last one, and you'll see this on the test very often. It says find the inverse of this for x is greater than or equal to 2. When it gives us this part, it's telling us we're only using that right side of the parabola. That's all you need to think about when you do this part here. Um, so we switch our x and our y values, and so we're going to get x equals negative y minus 2 squared plus 4. Again, we do not leave a y inside the equation. We need to solve for it. So the first thing I need to do is get rid of this plus 4. I take care of everything away from it first. That gives us x minus 4 is equal to a negative y minus 2 squared. I'm trying to get this part by itself first so I can take the square root. So I need to get rid of this negative. So I'm going to go ahead and divide by a negative 1. And all that does is really change my signs here. So that becomes negative x plus 4 is equal to y minus 2 squared. Now we're ready to get rid of the square since that's the only thing that's left here on this side. So I can take the square root. Since we're taking the square root of a square, we would need that plus or minus. But since we're only using one side of this parabola, I don't need the other side. 
So my answer doesn't need that plus or minus. I would just take that square root and be equal to y minus two. My last step, I add two here. And so we get y is equal to the square root of negative x plus four under the radical plus two on the outside of that radical. You wanna make sure that your line clearly stops before that plus two when you're writing it. We see a lot of students that haphazardly throw that out there and it goes over the two and then it's marked wrong. The two has to clearly be outside of it. I do not need the plus or minus since we restricted it to only one side of the parabola. Those are inverses.